Can we save our planet, our common home, if we don't first learn to care for one another? I don't think we can. I think in the fight against climate change, we have to be just as concerned about poverty and inequality as we are about fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions. Ten years ago, I was sitting in a marketplace trying to drink a cup of tea, but I couldn't. My hand was shaking too much. I was overwhelmed with a fury and a heartache at the devastation that's caused by poverty. You see, this marketplace was on my walk home from a hospice where I worked. And on the days when someone in that hospice that I was close to would die, I would stop in the marketplace to drink chai and try to gather my thoughts. On this particular day, the small team I worked with had found a man, maybe 50 years, lying in an underpass on the pavement near a local train station. He was very sick and very weak. He was, couldn't even tell us his name. We carried him to a taxi, and I traveled with him back to the hospice. On the way, he was leaning against me, and on the journey, he tugged my shirt and gestured that he wanted to smoke. So I asked the driver to pull over, and I bought him a cigarette. He seemed appreciative when I lit it for him, but he only managed a couple of drags, and then he died. So when we got to the hospice, it was in the late afternoon. Lunch was finished. The patients were sleeping and the staff were resting, so it was up to me to prepare his body for cremation at the GAT. I remember it very clearly because that was not something I normally did. I didn't tend to the deceased. And as I cleaned this man's body, my heart filled with that fury and heartache at the poverty that had killed him. Later on, standing in the marketplace, I looked for some spark of hope that might allow me to reconcile that man's death with my understanding of life, but I couldn't find it. The fury, the heartache didn't dissipate, it stayed with me. Around that marketplace, there was a maze of alleys, a shanty town of some 500 homes, homes made of loose brick, and tarpaulin, and pallets, and corrugated iron. I knew many of the people who lived in that community, and they were warm, and friendly, and kind, and dignified. But their lives were filled with a hardship and drudgery that no one here can understand. As I drank my chai, I saw a group of women standing close to me. They were huddled around a fan because it was an incredibly hot day, easily over 40 degrees Celsius. And as I watched them, the same thought occurred over and over in my head. We live in a world of fridges and washing machines, televisions, air conditioning, and yet this community can't access the electricity necessary to run a simple fan to power their homes. That was Park Circus Slum in Kolkata, or Calcutta, India, in the autumn of 2010. Two years later, I was back home in Ireland, surrounded by those fridges, washing machines, dishwashers, the things we take for granted. And I got a message from a friend in India to say the Park Circus Slum had burned to the ground and hundreds of families had lost their homes. What had happened was a man, desperate to get energy for his family, had taken a wire and connected his shanty to the power cables that ran over the railway line, which passed through the slum. 
In the middle of the night, this contraption had caught fire. The shanty had caught fire, and that fire turned into a blaze that engulfed and destroyed an entire community. I read that message, and I sank back into my chair, and I felt the same fury and heartache at the injustice that that community faced. This might sound like a strange place to start a conversation on climate change, but to me, this is the place we have to start. You see, globally and locally, our lives and our communities are interconnected. Poverty is not natural or inherent, and neither is marginalization. Like climate change, these are man-made phenomena. The climate breakdown confronts us with a survival paradox. In the face of climate change, there is no such thing as survival of the fittest. We either survive together through solidarity, cooperation, and enlightened self-interest, or we will fail together. Cast in this light, the tragedy of the Park Circus fire is a global tragedy. You see, there's a billion people living in this world today without access to energy. They need electricity. It will help them lift their communities out of the poverty in which they find themselves. And yet, if they walk the same fossil fuel pathway that we have, that alone will be enough to tip our climate past the point of no return. Faced with this paradox, our global community can do two things. We can collaborate or we can compete. Collaboration means sharing wealth, sharing resources, sharing knowledge, so that the leaders of those countries can have the means to lift their people out of energy poverty using renewable energy. But if we go down the path of competition, business as usual, we will exclude those people. And they will still pursue energy. They have to. It's a matter of survival. But they'll go down the fossil fuel route. And the consequences of that are unthinkable. The survival paradox is not just a global paradox. It's also national and local. Think about the origins of the Yellow Vest protests in France. On the surface, these can be seen as a protest against the carbon tax, and thus a protest against climate action. But nothing could be further from the truth. The carbon tax that was introduced by the French government in 2010 was regressive, meaning that it hit upon the poorest, the most vulnerable, the hardest. And this was just one in a series of regressive economic policies. So the Yellow Vests weren't protesting climate action. They were protesting against inequality. French people want climate action. In fact, according to a recent report, European perceptions of climate action, they are more horrified about the impacts of climate change than any of their European neighbors. The origins of those protests are based on a very simple assertion. That is that low- and middle-income communities should not bear the burden of the cost of climate action. Multinational companies have enriched themselves hugely through the exploitation of fossil fuels that have given rise to this crisis. We do need economic policies to change the course we're on, but unless those policies are designed with the rights and dignity of communities in mind, they will fail. And if they fail, precious time will be lost. We need to evolve our systems of governance so they are participative and inclusive, that they understand the needs of all. If we get to the point where only the wealthy can afford to take climate action, we will fail. Around the world, 
Trade unions and their workers are calling for a just transition. That is a transition that is underpinned by justice, a transition towards a low carbon economy. They recognize that there are workers in sectors like the extraction of fossil fuels, or the production of power, or even agriculture, high emission sectors where workers could be left stranded because of the shifts in investment that are necessary for climate action. A just transition demands that these workers and their unions are included in the planning so that they too can see a future for themselves and they can understand the pathway towards that future. They can understand the need for the move away from fossil fuels. And that seems only fair. After all, these are the same workers and the same communities upon whose backs industrialization and the prosperity that it brought with it was, were built. There's another reason to have a just transition. If we do not include people, if we do not allow the participation of all in the development of climate policy, then there will be resistance, people will rise, communities will rise, and we, the precious time that we have left to fight climate change will slip away. And we don't have that much time. The latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that we have until 2030 to re reduce carbon emissions by 45%. That is a global transformation unlike any that has ever happened in history, and we have a little over 10 years to do it. 10 years to solve the survival paradox. Now, I'm probably painting quite a bleak picture. In the face of climate change, in the face of climate breakdown, it is easy to feel hopeless. But I wouldn't be standing here today if I felt all hope was lost. I take hope from Greta Thunberg and the some million students who've taken to the streets to demand climate action. And I take hope in the survival paradox itself because the survival paradox allows us to get a vision of the world that survives the climate crisis. Can you imagine that? A world of empowered communities. A world where individualism and exceptionalism have been abandoned, and we have embraced community action that seeks to unlock the potential and uplift the horizons of everybody. You see, the survival paradox is both immediate and personal. It demands us to foster the very best of humanity in ourselves and in our communities. And we can do it. We can come together as active citizens, making sure that nobody is left behind in this transition. And we can have that spirit of solidarity rise from our communities and take over our governments. Active citizens can vote for servant leaders, people who put the needs of the many over their own needs. In Calcutta, when the suffering in that hospice became too great and my spirit was overwhelmed, I would turn to it for advice to a man called Jim McGuinness. Jim was Australian but claimed Irish heritage. And Jim was one of those heroes that you'll never read about in the newspapers or see on the television. He'd spent every day for the last 30 years serving people who really did need his help. He was a servant leader. Jim would tell me that the act of helping a dying person by lifting them from the street to a bed to give them some semblance of dignity in their final hours was nothing to be proud of. He would say to me, all it did was reveal the poverty that exists in ourselves. It took me a while to understand what he meant, but he was right. We all suffer many poverties, 
Poverties of courage, poverties of empathy, poverties of compassion. If we are serious about solving the survival paradox, if we really mean to leave our children and our grandchildren a safe world to grow old in, these are the poverties that we have to solve. Thank you.